I'd like to start by thanking Monsignor again. That was so inspiring. Oh, what a gift to be here. Truly, it's a gift. My goal is that you can continue to grow closer to the heart of Jesus, not just today, but each and every day, that you see his heart as your refuge, your spiritual security. You go to the heart of Jesus when life is hard. You go to the heart of Jesus when your own heart feels cold and apathetic, tempted to be overwhelmed or even anxious as we walk this earth. This day is so significant because we unite our hearts together to give worship to the Lord, to be open to new graces so that our lives can be impacted and changed. Because we really do live in extraordinary times. We really do live in a moment in history that we can choose Christ in a new way. And our yes will impact future generations. I truly believe that. Recently, I've been enjoying sharing, starting my talk with a very significant quote that has impacted me so very much. Archbishop Fulton Sheen in 1974 said, we are at the end of Christendom, but not Christianity, not of the church, but Christendom. These are great and wonderful days in which to be alive. It is not a gloomy picture, it is a picture of a church in the midst of increasing opposition from the world. And therefore, live your lives in full consciousness of this hour of testing and rally close to the heart of Jesus. Rally close to the heart of Jesus. I believe that's an invitation that's an invitation for each one of us to spend some time pondering, what does that look like in my very own life? As we look out into the world, we can see that in many ways, it's like one big suffering broken heart being expressed in so many ways. A year ago, I remember being here as the MC, talking about how front yards have become graveyards, marveling over this Halloween season that continues to grow and grow and grow. And now front yards proclaim in the state of Ohio where you stand on the dignity of the unborn child. But we have the solution to rally close to the heart of Jesus. In John 15, nine, it, abide in my love. Jesus wants us to constantly be in that love of his. He wants that love to come into our heart, to penetrate our heart, and then to go forth and impact our relationships. That is truly a challenge. For many of us, as we're here, it feels so good, right? It feels like all the troubles of the world are past us. But when we leave the church and we head back to our family and we head back to the workplace and we head back to even our own neighborhoods and communities, our relationships always need Christ because that's where that tension often lives. And it's so, so important. One of the reasons why I wrote the book, Holy Habits from the Sacred Heart, 10 Ways to Build Stronger, More Loving Relationships, is because I realized how difficult it was to share the love of Christ with others. I might have it in my heart, but a lot of times it feels like we can white knuckle our faith. Maybe we think it, maybe we wanna do it on our own. But Christ once, as Monsignor so beautifully said, he wants to be in our heart so that our heart can go forth and share the perfect love of Christ. This is something that requires prayer, asking the Lord, dedication, and even virtue so that our life looks different and that we can more and more reflect that of Christ. As um, I've been involved in, in serving as the director of the Sacred Heart Enthronement Network since 2018, I like to say that, you know, I began just as a mom on a journey, wanting to not only live my faith, but share it with others and help other Catholics, especially Catholic families. 
I remember interviewing my mom, um, who's here today, and I asked her about her family. I was intrigued by my grandfather's beautiful devotion to the Sacred Heart, getting images in homes, turning his, his basement into a workshop for the Lord, and also the beautiful work of the men of the Sacred Hearts in which other men were doing this beautiful apostolate. But I, I came to realize it's not just about the image. It was about how my relatives lived, how they had joy in the home, how that they were charitable in the way that they spoke. And my mom shared, I can recall, uh, well, I, I said, I, I can recall asking my mom about her family. And she said, looking back, I can see how the Sacred Heart was the cornerstone of my family faith devotion for both my parents, my grandparents, and my aunts and uncles. Like the air they breathed, devotion to the heart was filled um, our hearts and home for now four generations. God keeps his promises to our family through sickness, war, sorrows, and even joys in life. They stood firm in their faith and trusted in the Lord. And in the end, they died in the confidence that Jesus was victorious, and they were dying in him and in the sacraments of love. What a beautiful testimony to a simple Catholic family, where my grandfather worked the um, third shift at Ford Motor Company. He spent his whole life just caring for his family, but yet his witness and the witness of my other relatives began to show this roadmap of how to set up a life. Sometimes when I go out speaking, people will say, well, that's good for you. That's neat that you had really great Catholic families, but I'm a convert. I come from a broken family. I come from a lot of pain in my family. And the good news is that Jesus's heart is a healing heart heart. He literally wants to heal the family line. He wants to transform hearts so that the dysfunctional love that can penetrate and destroy and fragment families can re reunite us and reunite us to him. I also tell people that every one of us can make a choice each and every day to be a first generation Sacred Heart family a first generation that strives to love with the perfect example of Jesus, our Lord. And as Monsignor Lane shared, this love that pours forth from him from the cross. For who is our Lord? He is good and he is gentle. He is kind. He meets us where we are at and he meets our family where we are at as well. As my mom shared her testimony, I can remember when my own family did the enthronement of the Sacred Heart in the 1990s. I can remember my parents, and they spoke about it recently on St. Gabriel on the, whole, on the Sacred Heart Hour, that, that moment where we said, okay, Jesus, you get to take control of the family. I remember that ceremony so clearly that Jesus was able to be the king of our family. And then I recall from my own life as a mother of six children, the hustle and bustle of life at the time, and later seven children, that I remember a quiet evening where I realized I, I was at that empty point. I felt like my gas tank of love was way on empty. I didn't know how much more I had to give. And so before that image of the Sacred Heart, I knelt down. And every aspect of my life was placed into the heart of Jesus. That's what it means to give the Lord your joys and your sorrows, your vocation, your pain, your suffering. And it might seem so small. That moment was so small. It was a quiet evening, but it was what happened in the heart. And that's what he wants for you. That's how he wants to change the world, to set the world on fire. And then four years later, we do the enthronement of the Sacred Heart in our own family. And I still recall that beautiful day when my parents were there, my, my husband's family was there. And I remember thinking, okay, Lord, you know, what's gonna happen? I anticipate, I'm excited. And I will say a deepening enrichment of, of our devotion and our faith came forth. 
because the Sacred Heart devotion is not just once and done. The enthronement isn't just, you know, something that you do in passing like an insurance policy, you know, to heaven. Instead, it's a lifestyle, again, a roadmap, a way to view each and every encounter that we have with the Lord as an opportunity, an, an encounter we have even with others as well. See, Margaret Mary, 350 years ago, this December, marked this amazing opportunity in which Jesus appeared to her and gave us the 12 promises of the Sacred Heart. Over the course of 40 apparitions, three major apparitions, the first one being uh, this December 27th, we received these, these beautiful consolations rooted in scripture that are for us to be encouraged, for us to be renewed, for us to realize that all the graces the Lord is offering. So I'm going to read through these 12 promises and I'm going to pause and pray that maybe one of them, just one of them is the one that you say, yes, this is what I need today. This is what resonated with my heart. I will give them all the graces necessary for their state in life. I will establish peace in their homes. I will comfort them in their afflictions. I will be their secure refuge during life and above all in death. I will bestow an abundant blessings upon their undertakings. Sinners will find in my heart the source and infinite ocean of mercy. Lukewarm souls shall become fervent. Fervent souls shall quickly mount to high perfection. I will bless every place in which the image of my heart is exposed and honored. I will give priests the gift of touching the most hardened of hearts. Those who shall promote this devotion shall have their names written in my heart. I promise you in the excessive mercy of my heart that my all-powerful love will grant to all those who receive Holy Communion on First Friday in nine consecutive months the grace of final perseverance. They shall not die in my disgrace nor without receiving their sacraments. My divine heart shall be their safe refuge in their last moment. Each one of those promises, as my mom mentioned in the testimony of her own family, we've seen them lived out in the lives of the saints, of ordinary people, of religious, when Jesus' love is allowed into our hearts to be transformed and the counterfeits of love are removed. When we look into the heart of Christ and we, we say, you know, we, we know that, and we, we heard this earlier, that mercy pours forth from the heart of Jesus. We know that his heart burns out of love with great charity. We know that his heart is full of grace, but his heart is also full of virtue. The virtue that is required to change our behavior so that we can go forth and be that witness to others. I would like to begin with the virtue of docility. As I was putting together this recent book, I didn't know where to begin, but I, I looked to the Blessed Mother in her fiat, right, in Luke 1, when she said, may it be done according to your word. I realized the importance that she was saying yes. She was willing to be f let go of what she thought God's will was and be willing to be taught. Docility is the opposite of being stubborn or inflexible. Maybe there are some areas in our life in which we need to be more open to the Holy Spirit so that these new graces can flow, so that our, our hearts can be changed. I love when Father Stosh Daly always says, Jesus loves to rearrange, spiritually rearrange the furniture in our heart. Maybe it's our priorities. Maybe it's the way that we are just viewing our faith Maybe it's, it's stuck in this stubbornness of, of mud almost. St. Margaret Mary said, love, glory, and praise forever to the heart of our adorable Savior, which is all love, all loving, and all lovable. For all the good he will produce and work in souls by establishing the reign of his pure love in a well-disposed heart. 
So if we think of our heart like soil, we have to pull out, the, Jesus has to, through confession, through reconciliation, through beginning to be humble, to pull out those weeds so that maybe that stubbornness and inflexibility can be even revealed. I also love to meditate on Ezekiel 36, 26, where we read, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the hearts so of stone from your, and give you a heart of flesh. I often think about the heart of stone. And for many of us, I don't think we're hard hearted. I think that we're striving to be good but we might have a few pebbles. We might have a few pebbles lodged up there that need to be removed by the Lord so that our heart can change and what happens on the inside can be relatable to the how we live our life, how our family interacts with us, what people at work think of us, and making sure that the love of Christ literally goes forth and not saying this isn't easy, this is very, very challenging, but it's very, very important. We must remember that the more we work on our heart, the more that the Lord's able to reveal to us the type of person that maybe we are in a gentle way, but then the type of person in which we're able to go forth and be so that we can lower ourselves and be more humble and then be able to, to be that witness. One of the things that um, Jesus also told St. Margaret Mary is, I will reign through my heart despite Satan and his agents. Satan and his agents are everywhere. They are, we are absolutely in a spiritual battle. If you didn't know that, I'd love to tell you, I'm raising children, it's very, very challenging. The world offers such a flashy, um, glitzy, misinterpretation of love and everything else that is good and beautiful. I think we must first know that we are in a spiritual war, that the, we need new spiritual tools, that we need to come to the Blessed Sacrament, we need to come to Mass as frequent as possible. We must continue to maintain a disposition of humility with a combination of gratitude so that whatever we do, we, we do it out of love of God and that pride can't get his step in there. And when we have a constant state of hope as well and we don't look out into the world and become overwhelmed, instead we rejoice in all that the Lord is doing, we not only can be a witness to others, but we can experience the joy of the gospel. Because the joy of the gospel is the, the ability, the, the tangible witness in which people will see that it's worth discovering this love. It's worth encountering the love of Christ. Now, as we look at the spiritual battle, and each year we talk about the enthronement of the Sacred Heart, it might be easy to say, well, I did that. That was, that was good for our family. But I really want to spend some time going a bit deeper into it, because this is something in which each one of us are invited to the mission to promote, to invited the mission to live, to promote, and to share with others. St. Margaret also says, you know, publish the devotion everywhere, Pro promote it, recommend it to people of the world as a sure and easy means to obtain for me a true love for God. Jesus also says to St. Margaret Mary, as an assured means to touch the hardest of hearts and finally to all the faithful as the most solid devotion, the most proper to obtain victory over the strongest passions, to establish union and peace in the midst of divided families, to get rid of the most long-standing imperfections, to obtain the most ardent and tender love for me. In short, to arrive in little time and in very easy manner at the most sublime perfection. So how are we gonna do that? We're gonna do that by allowing Christ into our hearts and homes. Father Matteo shared, therefore receive Jesus into your home as the king and the friend. 
He is a king, as he himself said to the sublime majesty of the coward Pilate, and he desires that every family and every nation should recognize and proclaim his kingship over society. He asks it of you as an act of reparation and consolation to his heart. See him stand at the door of countless houses, rich and poor, crowned with thorns. His hair is wet with the dew of the night, begging and imploring to be admitted, asking for a shelter from the tempest that has broken out amongst the world. He is knocking with his wounded hands and saying to you, I am Jesus. Be not afraid. I am the king of love. Open to me. And with that, what moments do we need to open the front door of our homes to Jesus? At what moments do we need to make sure that he can come in to remove the imperfections, remove the disordered passions of our life that have such a grip on us, to give up the vice that we freely choose? This is the moment when Jesus stands at the door and, and, and we have to invite him in. Father Matteo also said, I understood what our Lord wished of me. The plan was to reconquer the world home by home, family by family, for the love of the heart of Jesus. Those words were shared about 100 years ago. And the enthronement was officially established in the church in 1907. And in 1915, Father Matteo received an audience with Pope Benedict XV, who on that following April 27th, he received a letter of approval with the official definition of enthronement being the installation of the image of the Sacred Heart as on a throne in a place of the highest honor of the house so that Jesus Christ, our Lord, visibly reigns in the Catholic homes. The letter went on to say, the means of this enthronement is not a short-lived consecration, a passing family celebration. It is rather truly placing Jesus on the throne of the heart of the family so that he remains there as king with the family, uniting around his throne and offering him adoration and love. This is the vision for the Catholic family. This is where we're going to get those new graces, where healing's going to take place, where the beginning of forgiveness can take place as well. Pope Benedict XV also said that there were three attacks on the family at the time, and I think it's pretty relevant today. Divorce, which weakens the stability of the family. The monopoly in teaching, which eliminates the authority of the parents and the search for pleasure, which often breaks or violates the very laws of nature. Enthronement brings to these evils a double remedy of practical love and enlightened faith. So we not only seek in, to live this devotion to the Sacred Heart, to put Jesus as King and Lord of our home, but we want the practical love. We want that love that's not a counterfeit. But we also want enlightened faith so that we can continue to, to grow closer to the Lord. Pope Benedict XV also said, or, pro, promote propagate above all things the Christian spirit in the home by setting up in each family the reign and the love of Jesus Christ. And in doing this, you are but obeying our divine Lord himself, who promised to shower his blessings upon the home where the image is exposed and honored. It's important that we understand the significance of the work that we do in living this and promoting this. Father Matteo also said, it is not enough for you to be a fervent Catholic, earnest and pious for you. The apostleship is a duty and not a luxury. It is your duty to save the souls of others and to do so you ought to be something more than just teachers. You must help our Lord catch souls for eternity. The enemies of Christ struggle hard and the sacrifice themselves in every way to prevent souls from entering heaven. The enemies of our divine King are often more zealous than his friends. 
May we encounter the flame and love of Christ. May we help to be the living stones of the church and go forth. Each one of us know people that are suffering. Each one of us know people that need this unbelievable gift of the devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus. And how we share the devotion, as we learn, is not just teachers. We're not just teachers. We're here to do a beautiful duty, the duty to help the souls of others to go forth. And as Father Mateo said, it is not just, you know, it, it, is, it is part of our, our, the, gift, the gift we get to give to future generations. Because if we're willing to pick up the torch of faith and share it with others, most importantly, the people that we have relationships with, that is how we transform the, our world. That is how the people around us encounter the love of Christ. And in conclusion, I, I just want to invite you to go deeper into the heart of Jesus. I invite you, in each one of your packets, you received a little card for the nine First Fridays, where you'll have a little heart. You can write the date in, go to First Friday Mass, live this devotion, be renewed. Listen to our Sacred Heart Hour program on the first Friday of the month. Be renewed by the words of Father Stosh Daly and um, my parents. I'll be doing a, a campaign this Advent, the Sacred Heart, quotes from St. Margaret Mary during Advent to lead you to the love of Christ on Christmas. This is for each one of us to encounter his love. So by you sharing the enthronement with others, and we have self-guided enthronement kits over there, and Tim will be talking more about some of the resources that we have, it's because we care and we want to be the premier apostolate for promoting devotion to the Sacred Heart. We want your families to be renewed. We want joy back in your, your own heart. And we want to be able to be, again, those little, those little stones of love. But it's only going to happen with humility, with the virtues, and that we can live them and then go forth and share them with others. So thank you for allowing me to be here today.